What is going on, y'all? Once again, this is the Club of the Man 1993. Shave face on this late Friday evening. And we are here for a pre recorded review, not live, to review the first episode of AEW Dynamite from the January 4th, 2023 edition. It's a new year, a new presentation. New stage, new graphics, new music too, I believe, as well. And a new city. As for the first time, AEW Dynamite comes to you from the beautiful city of Seattle, Washington. Which, again, is a nice city. I definitely recommend go visiting it. I did once. It was five years ago? Yeah, five years ago, because my sister used to live in Seattle. Very beautiful city. Definitely recommend checking it out. And let me tell you something. Again, this was the night before the return of Vince McMahon. Night before Tony Khan issued a tweet saying, Man, for the past 24 hours, people have been extra nicer to me. And I wonder why. (laughs) Oh, Tony. Oh, Tony. You are not afraid to express your ego just a little bit. Just a little bit. But, of course, this is before that happened. And I will say, so far, after, you know, the inconsistent, like, second half of fall of 2022. Started to pick up towards the end of, the, of 2022. I think Dynamite, with their new presentation, for the most part, got off to a pretty good start for 2023. We have a path, of course, set for a the... Um, the most likely main event of AEW Revolution 2023 that, of course, will have people wondering um, how many matches will be on that card, especially with the main event that was basically announced, but, of course, we have to get there with the story, of course. So, we'll talk about it. But overall, great episode. Great start. And again, I'm I really enjoyed this. So hope to God again. If things I'm worried about happen, hope to God later on this year, I may be calling AEW once again the place to be. For now, though, it's up in the air. But we'll see, of course, what happens. But as we talk about the January fourth, twenty twenty episode again of AEW Dynamite. So we opened up the show with one of the matches that I was looking forward to on this show. And that was the match with Chris Jericho and absolute Ricky Starks. And I thought this match was pretty good. Of course, we had members of the JAS out there trying to help Chris Jericho. Ricky Starks, though, again, who has been on fire lately. Again, you can tell that Ricky Starks is the latest, like, main event project that uh, Tony Khan is focused on pushing. Which, again, awesome. I've always thought Ricky Starks was an excellent talent. But since he's turned face, again, he has really, really stepped it up. And is is clearly becoming one of my favorite wrestlers today, for sure. Um, Towards the end of the match... There, of course, you know, was a couple times in this whole show where they got me. This one, of course, I wasn't wouldn't have quite been as pissed about, but one that happened later did piss me off until they fixed it. And I am praying to God that the taping of Battle of the Belts tonight, they did not do anything stupid with something. But I'll get to that in a second. So towards the end of the match, um. Uh, Chris Jericho had um, Ricky Starks in the walls of Jericho. Um, as they're in, <laughs> as the walls are locked in, and Ricky Starks is near the ropes, here comes Cool Hand Ange, Angelo Parker, and Matt Menard. I still don't give two shits about them. Uh, they came out trying to interfere. One distracted referee, Aubrey Edwards. And uh, the other one went on the other side and decked Ricky Starks while in the walls of Jericho with Floyd, uh, Jericho's 
baseball bat. And um, you thought that that was going to be it for Ricky Starks. Well, when Aubrey Edwards went to see if he had passed out or not, one, two, I sneeze again. I'm good. Three. It looked like for a second that Ricky did actually, you know, touch the mat, but then he pulled the arm back up and it's like, not today, not today. And I'm just like, holy smokes, I thought that was it. So he turned around, did a couple other, you know, like, you know, moves and whatnot for a couple of them, you know, a palm strike, small package, front kick uh, from Jericho to get a tornado DDT, but then took out uh, 2.0 with punches off the ropes. And then Ricky Starks hits a spear on Chris Jericho and pins him clean. And I'm like, awesome. I, I, Rick, they gave Ricky Starks a win. But then after the match, the JAS start to attack Ricky Starks. And then out came Action on Andretti, the, the jobber who beat Chris Jericho right after um, Full Gear. Who had, last time we saw him, he took a fireball to the face. Comes out to make the save with a steel chair. He then, of course, gets the upper hand until Anna J and Ty Mello come out and take him out with a low blow. And then Jake Hager in his stupid hat that's now on AEW Shop, which I'm not buying. I hate the hat. I absolutely hate the hat. But Hager comes in and... and they basically beat down Action Andretti, and then they power bomb Ricky Starks off the apron through a table. So is this setting up for another match, or like like the the beat down afterwards and having the the, the JAS stand tall without like no additional help besides Action Andretti felt a little pointless to me. I don't know. It's like I get what they were trying to do, but again, it just felt like something was missing. From that beatdown. Like why have him win. Then get him like beat down like 6 on 2. Or whatever the heck it was called. For him to go through a table. Like what else is there. Like, are you going to do maybe like a street fight or something in a few weeks. Or a lights out match or something. I don't know. I mean I'm happy Ricky won. Again I, I'm quickly becoming a lot more of a fan of his. But again just that, that, that beat down afterwards just felt a little pointless. I'm like why do we do that. So I'm not sure what that was, but it was what it was. Um, then we had an interview with Hangman Adam Page in the ring, getting a medical update. Um, he said, as of today, he is not medically cleared. He's been told that if he gets into a fight, though, with Mox, he's going to get set back at least for another week. And he doesn't want that, though. He wants to fight Mox next week. In the form, and if he takes a red eye home tonight and gets that last brain scan and it comes back good, he'll be cleared for a match with Moxley next week. And then he says this line. There was a couple strange lines that was said on this show. He said, I don't care if it's in the ring, in catering, or on the roof. He'll fight John Moxley and knock his dick in the dirt. And I'm like, what the heck does that mean? Like, I go to a couple, like, vulgar ideas of what that could be, but I don't know. And I don't know if Renee Young, of course, would approve Hangman doing that. Remember that slap that she gave Miz? Well, if you mess around with Mox, you may get slapped again. So I would watch yourself there, Hangman. But out does come John Moxley. He's, he's, he's surprised that Hangman's here tonight after everything he's been through. He's sick of people treating something so beautiful like it was a tragic accident of this candlelight vigil for Hangman Adam Page. He gets dethroned briefly by a bad mic, of course, and his mic starts acting up, but continues. And then, of course, I think he even, like, you know, says, like, what the... What, he, I think Mox dropped the F-bombs, like, what the fuck is this or whatnot. And then finally, he was, oh, sorry, go Seahawks, wherever he got the microphone working again or something like that. That was, you know, a little stranger as well, but, you know. But once he gets the mic working, um, when he thinks of everything he's put his body through, nobody's gotten knocked down more times than him in this business. The plates and plates of crap 
he had to eat and the miles and miles of crap he had to crawl through. And Hangman plays the victim because he got knocked out? That idea makes Mox sick. But Hangman asks if he thinks he's mad that he got knocked out. But he's been knocked out more times than he can count by enemies, strangers, and by his best friends. What he's actually angry about is how Mox called him out and didn't let him get a word in before he made a joke. He nearly took his career from him and changed his life and he wants to crack jokes about it? Hangman thinks he knows why. He thinks Mox felt threatened in the moment. He's had a month to stew on what he said and two months to stew about being knocked out with a lariat. Simple, brutal, and effective. He knows a thing or two about lariats, though. He's got two in the chamber with Mox's name on them. And he gets them at the forum, referring to his buckshot lariats. Mox was like, the only joke that's funny is that Hangman thinks next time is going to be any different. His little punk ass doesn't belong in the ring with him. Next week, though, he's going to make sure Adam doesn't get back up. So, and I believe I saw on Rampage tonight, Hangman did in fact get cleared. So we are going to get a match next week with Moxley, with Mox and Hangman. Some people are saying they think this should lead to a John Moxley heel turn. Honestly, I wouldn't mind seeing it. I think they were setting up for it. Uh, last year, well, sorry, well, technically, no, not last year, well, two years ago, in November, in the bill for Full Gear 2021, which was probably supposed to be John Moxley versus Brian Danielson, and of course, that's when Moxley checked himself into rehab, but you couldn't bring him back as a heel after that, but, um, I think that was, that was where they were going to try to turn Moxley heel, but obviously right now, well, at the time, and coming back, and you know, in the example he set, that's not quite what you want to do. So I'm still wondering because you know he's played de facto heel a few times this past year. This may be the time to do it. I mean, he worked him and Claudio worked heel last week against Top Flight. I think you do it again. I've really not had a, a good taste of the best of heel John Moxley because one time I saw him when he really was a heel. Besides when he seemed to be a heel first when he came into AEW, but then he transitioned to a babyface very quickly. But of course, it's when he turned heel as Dean Ambrose in 2018. And yeah, we all remember how much that sucked with his gas masks and hazmat suits and whatnot. But we'll see what happens. Uh, Samoa Joe cuts a promo on Darby Allen in a video package, headed up for the main event later on the show with. Um, uh, Samoa Joe and Darby Allen match number two for the TNT title. Then we have our second, well, sorry, not second, but our first uh, title match of the show, and it's a tag match again with the acclaimed versus Jay Lethal and Jeff Jarrett. And again, I still to this day do not understand. Why Jay Lethal and Jeff Jarrett are getting this match? I mean, I've never seen them wrestle on Rampage. The only time I've seen them wrestle is at, what, full gear and they lost? So, I don't get why are they giving Jeff Jarrett all this TV time and yet why, how did he earn a tag title opportunity? I do not get that. The match was fine. Of course, what happened, though, was they swerved me. And trust me, at first, I was pissed. I was absolutely pissed. Because at first, Jay Lethal and Jeff Jarrett won with a lateral press from Lethal onto Anthony Bowens. But then, as the pin was going on, uh, uh, Anthony Bowens put his foot on the rope. But then Sanjay Dutt, who was outside the ring, pushed the foot off the ropes. And at first, the referee did not see that until another referee came down and told what happened. And they agreed to restart the match. And I'm like, thank God, because I didn't want to see Jeff Jarrett and Jay Lethal win the belts. But they restarted the match, and then the acclaim did come around with the victory. But somehow, again, it led to uh, them doing a rematch 
on Battle of the Belts tonight. I didn't get to read the results, but I'm hoping to God. I am hoping to God. God, I firmly believe in you. I'm hoping to God, though, that they did not give them their be those belts. Of all people, the Acclaim should not be dropping those belts to Jay Lethal and Jeff Jarrett. Jay Lethal, maybe, because I like Jay Lethal. I just cannot stand what they're doing with Jeff Jarrett. And again, I do not understand why Jeff Jarrett is all of a sudden that important to AEW. I do not get it. But the Acclaim retain here. Thank God. We also have... Dr. Britt Baker, DMD, and Jamie Hayter being interviewed backstage. Britt thinks a more interesting question. Well, first she was asked about Soraya's tag mystery partner for the, their tag match in Los Angeles next week. And Britt's like, I think it's more interesting is that Sor will Soraya ever really understand what AEW means and how things work around here? They are AEW originals. And they're, they've had very hard similar paths, but they worked their way up from the top. And now Jamie Hayter is your AEW Women's Champion. Jamie's the champ. Britt's the boss. Hayter's the killer. Baker is the pillar. Let me just jump also to later on in the show where Renee Paquette interviewed Soraya. With Tony Storm and Hikaru Shida sitting by her side. So, Soraya basically, you know, mentioned how she has two of the best wrestlers in, in the world. It's tough to pick, but she picked Tony. Basically, like, making Hikaru Shida pissed off. So, you announce this match. You talk nothing about it for, like, a few weeks. Now, all of a sudden, the week before, you're announcing that Tony Storm, who is a very obvious pick, is going to be the tag partner. And we have the other person who was not picked, not too happy about it. Does anybody else think this is a swerve? I still do. I still think, you know, I've heard the rumors saying, no, I'm not coming. I think that's not true either. I really think what's going to happen is Tony Storm will, of course, try to enter the ring, but she will get attacked. Either make it a mystery, they'll, make, they'll reveal who attacked her, just like show her backstage, you know, down and out, or just straight up reveal it right away that it's Hikaru Shida turning heel, which, you know, when I saw Shida's reaction, I'm like, you know what? She's been a face, you know, her whole, you know, career so far in AEW. We need a fresh heel. Well, we kind of have that now because Athena turned heel, but I haven't really seen much of her work because it's mostly been on Rampage and now Ring of Honor. But, you know what? I was just like, yeah. I wouldn't mind seeing Hikaru Shida as a heel for something different. I think it's a swerve. And especially also when you have Britt Baker calling herself the boss. You can't tell me that that is a tease for Mercedes Monet. And also, I'm pretty sure, again, Tony Khan is not that dumb that, you know, you would tease it and fans, you know, are predicting it. You wouldn't think he wouldn't make an attempt to bring in Mercedes, which, by the way, let me talk about it fairly briefly also. Mercedes Monet, yes, she's officially Mercedes Monet, did debut in New Japan after the at Wrestle Kingdom 17 this past week, uh, after Kyrie retained her IWGP Women's World Title, Sasha re debuted, of course, you know, in New Japan as Mercedes Monet. Had a great theme song, great look. It was odd though she was wearing a wig. She did botch her finisher though. That was the big downside, but you know, she had her intentions clear, and she's gonna be fighting Kyrie for the IWGP Women's World Title at some Japan show in February. You cannot tell me, though, that Tony Khan announces a tag match, waits a few weeks just for uh, Soraya to pick an obvious choice to tag partner in Tony Storm and tease a heel turn from Hikaru Shida just for this not to be a swerve. 
I really, really get, get, had this gut feeling that this Wednesday we're going to be seeing Mercedes Monet uh, appear in AEW. Just say, it's my prediction. I wouldn't say it's a clear spoiler, but I just had these inklings. I really think, though, when Tony knows when to capitalize, <coughs> he goes for it. He actually listens to the audience. Either way, though, I think in some way or form, he's going to try to bring in Mercedes Monet. Even if it's a one-off for now, I think he's going to attempt to bring her in. Um, we also have a segment with Jungle Boy saying for one night only, he and Hook will take care of business together. I think, I think they're taking on Big Bill, and I can't remember who the other one was they're taking on next week. Uh, but then we have the American Dragon, Brian Danielson, with a hometown hero welcome. Crowd was hot for him. And of course, this is his first appearance in Washington State since he left WWE and came to AEW. So he got a hero's welcome. He fought Tony Nese and basically for the most part squashed him. So the match was good. But then of course afterwards Brian says it's good to be home. He's feeling a little froggy though but he's ready for another fight. So he calls out MJF and MJF comes out. And when he came out I'm like okay let me sit up for a second because this might be a bit. And of course it was. MJF's like do I got this straight? Brian wants another match tonight? How about no? He doesn't have his rocks off entertaining these schmucks. And he's not a mark like Danielson. He knows he gets a check whenever he wrestles or not. And that's what makes him a special attraction. If Lance Storm and Dean Malenko with all the respect of the baby, it would be more charismatic than he is. Uh, Brian looks much like a goat. Uh, he would be surprised if Mama Danielson couldn't find a, a human suitor back in 1981. Brian says, if we're going to make jokes, all the boys in the back talk about how many human suitors Max's mom had. Enough to fill in the arena. He, of course, tries to take surveys of who is a, um, who is a human, who is, um, one of Max's mom's human suitors and whatnot, as he kept asking. Um... And MJF was getting more mad about it as Ryan went on and on. But MJF was just like, talk about guys like Disco Inferno, Eric Bischoff, and the smartest of all, um, Jim Cornette, have all put him over. And Brian's like, shut up, enough. We've heard this a million times. Um, and he, he hates MJF and he wants to fight him. But MJF was literally running away and tells him, slow his roll. This is pro wrestling, and here, wins and losses do matter. Obviously, firing shots at WWE there. Uh, and Brian can't wrestle him yet because Brian needs to become number one contender. Um, so, he knew that Brian was up to something, so MJF went and talked to, to that nerd, Tony Khan himself. And if, if Brian Danielson wins every match now he has between... Now, and February 8th, he'll become number one contender. And he'll be nice to not have him go through a bunch of extra hoops. But uh, if he wins every week, between now and then, he'll give him a title match at Revolution. And Brian says, nope, I'm just going to wrestle when I want, become number one contender, and then beat the, him for the title. And MJF's like, no, 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 no. You're not becoming number one contender the way you want to. I want you to come the way I want to. And if you don't do that, my lawyer will get involved. And he'll and, and if that happens, Brian will never wrestle him. And of course, Brian's then skeptical of Mark Sterling's legal proness. But he'll agree if he gets to make a stipulation for the match at Revolution. And MJF's like, sure, you'll probably be able to cheat openly with any, um, I'll probably be able to cheat anyway with any openly stipulation. But Brian was like, I've got a real test of being a pro wrestler. A one hour Iron Man match. And I'm like, oh boy. Which sounds awesome. I mean, 
Yes, like, I would rather have him save that for, like, maybe him and Cesaro. I'm sorry, him and Claudio. But, dang, that's still... That's big stuff there. And MJF thought about it, but he agrees. Only because he doesn't think Brian will make it. Because all Brian does is choke. But if Brian says, I'll run through everybody in front of him... And then he's going to expose him in the Iron Man match. Show he doesn't have the cardio, the footwork, and that he doesn't have what it takes to be champion. He's going to kick his damn head in. Great promo, of course. And, of course, I am, again, intrigued by this idea. Again, like I said, I'd rather see Brian have like, that one-hour match against someone like Claudio. But it will be interesting, again, of course, to see what he does with MJF. Like I said though earlier also, does this mean we're going to have less matches at Revolution? Because especially since it's on a freaking Sunday, it's not going to be, you know, the best site. Say it to all, like, what if you wrestling for like four hours just to, you know, on a, you know, a Sunday and have to go straight to bed and get ready for work the next day. So, we'll see how that goes. Um, A.R. Fox lost to Swerve Strickland, who came out with, um, his new, um, stable, whatever the heck that they're, 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 they're called. Um, you know, the solid match. I didn't realize how much A.R. Fox also looks like Chavo Guerrero. But, Swerve wins with the Swerve Stomp. Uh, then we have the interview with Soraya and, uh, and, um, Tony and Sheeta and all that. Um... The ass boys have like a funeral thing for FTR when they beat them and how they've lost all the titles, this, this, and that. Um, FTR's music though did hit and the, and the ass boys like, haha, we tricked you. Uh, and, they, and they'll and they never work for AEW again. So I guess that's me. You know, right now they probably are getting ready to take their break or whatever because then they just drop all their titles. It might be. I also get some hype for that ladder match next week for Death Triangle uh, and the Elite. We had Jay Cargill and Red Velvet take on Kiara Hogan Sky Blue. Match was, you know, decent. Uh, getting ready for Jay Cargill's match against Sky Blue. Although they have been teasing Red Velvet turning on the baddies. Because they, they said she's had a good bond with Kiara Hogan. So they teased that in that match too. Uh, Jay Cargill and Red Velvet do win by pinfall. With a big boo for Cargill on the Kira Hogan. And then we have Jeff Jarrett bitching about um about the uh, no holds barred about about his, their match and he wants a no holds barred match for a rematch with tag titles at Battle of the Belts and they got granted. Um Excalibur also does his best micro machine guns to hype up next week's show. And then the main event was match number two with Darby Allen again, another hometown guy, and Samoa Joe for the TNT title. Second match again was just as awesome as the first match. Uh, again, these two have incredible chemistry, and I'm glad they ran this back. And, you know, we had the trend of where WWE was not getting everybody you know wins in our hometowns. Well, we got a big surprise here as Darby Allen did in fact beat Samoa Joe for the TNT title. Hmm. I was surprised. Darby wins a title for a second time and and Sting comes out to celebrate uh in the ring with Darby. But yeah, I was surprised. I really thought that with this whole gimmick of King of Television, I thought they would have, you know, him, you know, hold on to the belt for quite a while. Unless of course this is temporary, and again, they only did that just to, you know, give him a moment in Seattle. But hey, if Darby's TNT champ or any champ, I'm not gonna complain. I love Darby. Especially as champion, too. But he's a two-time. And he's the third multiple-time... Sorry, fourth multiple-time TNT champion. Because Cody Rhodes was a multiple-time TNT world champion. Sammy Guevara was. And so was Scorpio Sky. So we can see he's now the fourth multiple-time uh, TNT champion. Congrats to Darby Allen. And again, that is Rampage. I mean, that is Dynamite. I gave the show a B. I thought about it, but yeah, I gave it a B. I'm sorry, a B plus. Again, a couple little dips, such as again the whole thing with you know uh, Ricky Starks winning, but he gets beat down afterwards. I was a little meh about that. 
Um, again, I was not a fan at first when they had Jeff Jarrett and Jay Lethal uh, almost win the tag titles, but then, of course, they fixed it by, you know, having them say, nope, the foot was on the rope, and go play show, so restart the match and whatnot, so that I really like the stuff with Brian and the MJF again. Brian, both Brian and Darby, both hometown heroes, both got heroes welcomes in their matches. So that's exciting. And um, yeah, with that being said, I'm going to check out here again a B plus for Dynamite this week. What are your guys' thoughts on uh, Dynamite? Make sure you guys leave thoughts down in the comment section below. Be sure to always do slap a like on the video and subscribe for more content on my channel. And follow me on Twitter as well at the Club of the Man 93 Be sure to always to shout for Meatball Sub and follow me on TikTok at the Club of the Man 1993 and Until then, guys, I'm checking out. I'll catch you guys all later. Have a great rest of your night. And peace out, everybody. No way.